good evening and welcome to ipa 50 new horizons in physics webinar series 12th lecture today i apologize due to some unforeseen circumstances today's uh, uh, lecture earlier was scheduled by professor aditi sen day which is now postponed she will talk on quantum technology but today we are very happy to have dr basudev das gupta who will talk about uh, another completely different dimension the impossible dream of neutrino astronomy it gives me a great pleasure to introduce my young colleague to you dr basudev das gupta is a theoretical physicist at tata institute of fundamental research he studies stars the early universe particles like neutrinos and dark matter he leads the max planck partner group for astroparticle physics at tifr he has had a illustrious career all throughout he was the kvpy fellow as an undergraduate and then he did his phd in tifr in 2009 after postdoc in uh, max planck institute in munich and in columbus usa as well as iit ptrst he joined tifr as a faculty member in 2014 and he is continuing on his search for neutrinos since then he has received several honors he has won the marie curie fellowship in 2008 insa young scientist medal in 2011 ramanujan fellowship in 2015 ictp prize in 2019 and swarna jayanti fellowship in 2020 so we look forward to an exciting talk from dr basudev das gupta at the outset i should thank him uh, i thank him for giving this talk at a very short notice and uh, i'm sure the uh, ipa uh, audience looks forward to his uh, interesting story from him over to you basudev let me stop sharing okay thank you vandana thank you all of you for coming thank you for inviting me uh, it's a pleasure uh, to come and speak to this audience uh, i'll tell you about uh, neutrino astronomy most of you uh, who i can see here on zoom are experts and perhaps don't need to be told this story but i am told that there are also a lot of uh, people attending via youtube and perhaps they will even watch this lecture later uh, so i'll keep the lecture at a somewhat general level uh, uh, you know this is what the, i think uh, the, uh, the aim here is uh, so but do ask uh, any questions uh, that come to your mind um, especially if i am uh, you know going too fast or if i am uh, you know glossing over some details making a mistake please do feel free to point out and you know it's better uh, that we discuss okay so now what i'll do is i'll uh, turn my camera off and uh, switch to my uh, screen and then um, perhaps towards the end of uh, my talk again we can switch back on so give me a second i'll bring my slides up Okay. Are my slides visible? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, this is a talk about uh, the impossible dream of neutrino astronomy. Why impossible? Because to begin with, neutrinos are one of those particles that were, in some ways, doubted by their very own parent. so we are all familiar with this story that wolfgang pauli a very famous theoretical physicist in the 1930s like one of the real greats he invented this neutrino particle i say invented because there was some experiment which was not very well explained basically electrons in some experiment were seen to have a very smooth continuous spectrum whereas only a specific discrete value was expected and one way to explain this discrepancy was to introduce a an then unknown new particle called the neutrino which is what he did but then he also had to propose that this particle is so light that you know it has almost no mass and it has no charge so it does not interact with other particles very much so you will not basically be able to detect it so to You know, in science, we usually don't do such things. That you know, we do not appeal to things that cannot be tested. So he, you know, in a letter says that I have done something very bad by proposing a particle that cannot be detected. 
it is something that no theorist should ever do unfortunately this is not an advice that present day theoretical physicists like me follow very well uh, but it's good to keep in mind what the ideals of the field are so nevertheless this is how the neutrino was introduced and uh, as you can see the parent uh, already had big doubts about uh, the neutrino not only you know parents sometimes don't like their children or that they are particularly harsh on their children but even neighbors were not particularly enthusiastic about this child you know the neutrino so these are again two very very famous physicists hans bethe and uh, rudolf piers and they say that they calculate what is the chance that you can detect a neutrino and uh, they say that it has a penetrating power of 10 to the 16 km in solid matter i hope you can all see this it says see that penetrating power of 10 to the 16 km in solid matter so they said that well that means you know you will not be able to detect it because even if you make a detector that is 10 to the 16 km long basically you know the neutrino just goes through it and so says it is therefore absolutely impossible to observe processes of this kind with the neutrinos created in nuclear transformations there is no practically no possible way of observing the neutrino so this is what other famous physicists said at the very beginning but as it turns out you know this was premature this you know very pessimistic view of the fact that neutrinos cannot be detected most of you i imagine have heard talks on neutrinos so i'm not going to tell you all the history of how neutrinos were detected and all of these things that is a story for another day but it suffices to say that not only are neutrinos very ubiquitous you know they are produced by the early universe you know the big bang produced neutrinos quite a lot of them in fact they are the second most abundant particle in the universe after photons the earth produces neutrinos due to radioactivity inside the earth this is actually an appreciable part of you know the radioactivity is an appreciable part of why the earth you know gets hot from within the sun produces uh, neutrinos in this case not through radioactive decay of some particle uh, of some uh, element but rather through fusion which eventually makes neutrinos exploding stars stars which are approximately 10 15 times the mass of the sun towards the end of their life they undergo an explosion called supernova and they emit lots of neutrinos cosmic rays coming from outer space hit the air surrounding us in the atmosphere and produce pions which then decay and then they make neutrinos these are called atmospheric neutrinos and then finally there are far away black holes that are rotating and stuff is falling into those black holes and they have these things called jets and accretion disks and particles can be accelerated in these very far away very massive very highly uh, uh, energetic environments and they can produce neutrinos uh, which are called cosmic neutrinos so you know neutrinos span not just a wide variety of environments and different mechanisms by which they are created but also energies so the big bang neutrinos are effectively 100th of a milli electron volt in energy whereas the cosmic neutrinos at the very right they are the most energetic and they can be you know 10 pv in energy and you know when i started my career which is not that long ago uh, perhaps uh, you know i leave that as a puzzle for the viewer mm. many of these were not yet detected for example uh, the cosmological data was not yet good enough to have said that we have detected this even now there is only indirect evidence for this this had not yet been detected the neutrinos from the earth core the geo neutrinos had not been detected the solar neutrinos had been detected the atmospheric neutrinos had been detected and the supernova neutrinos had been detected once in 1987 and that, but the situation has changed a lot since then now we have indirect evidence 
from this you know, discovery of cosmic accelerator news is one of the greatest success stories in the last decade this is going to be the second half of our talk the solar and neutrino uh, solar neutrino and atmospheric neutrino detections are classical success stories for which nobel prizes have been given and uh, you have probably heard about it or you will hear about it elsewhere geo neutrinos is also an interesting story this is not that old uh, a detection uh, i will not talk about it today i will focus today's talk on these two kinds of neutrinos so neutrinos from stars so to say so su from supernovae and from black holes okay and these two are what i will uh, call astrophysical neutrinos because in a certain sense these are the farther away objects you know big bang is of course everywhere Uh, so we don't count that earth is very close the sun is also relatively close the atmosphere is of course basically just the skin of the earth so the two sources that are relatively far away are supernovae and these cosmic neutrino sources and these are the two that we are going to talk about because we are interested in astronomy you know you can also look at the sun but that that we don't really call astronomy usually you know sun is solar physics it's very well studied uh, so we want to talk about somewhat farther away objects so that's what i said all right so let's start with supernovae so i again remind you the talk is going to be in two parts first i will talk about neutrinos coming from supernovae these are uh, stars which are about 10 to 15 times larger than the sun that explode at the end of their life make a lot of neutrinos and these neutrinos have roughly energies between 1 to 100 mev these are the first thing that i will talk about and the next thing that i will talk about are cosmic accelerator neutrinos these are very far away objects typically black holes at the centers of galaxies which then accelerate neutrinos and they are much larger energies so supernovae first so why are we interested in supernovae because supernovae are very very intensely bright sources you know so one of the my favorite ways of uh, arguing how bright supernovae are is that suppose you have a hydrogen bomb you know that's that goes off literally right in front of your eye whereas you make a supernova explosion at the distance of the sun you know where our sun right now is if you ask which one will you will see as a brighter source you know you might be amazed that the supernova happening at the location of the sun will be brighter than a hydrogen bomb going off right in front of your eye so it's it's a really really amazing um you know uh, object this supernova uh, it, it it's one of the most spectacular events that happens in the universe but coming back to a little bit more uh, you know scientific uh, appreciation of supernovae and they are very powerful ex explosions and you know they can become as bright as an entire galaxy but what makes them important is that they are the sites where heavy elements such as gold silver carbon oxygen these things are made and black holes are also made at least some fraction of black holes are made by supernovae so many interesting things things that are of relevance to biology things that are of relevance to life things that are you know of importance to physics and you know understanding of the universe and perhaps even some practical uh, notion of valuable uh, objects um, are connected to supernovae and they are very interesting the quality of physics and the kind of physics associated with supernovae are very rich and they have led to a ho whole bunch of uh, nobel prizes uh, given you few of them here so they are very interesting just to study on the other hand neutrinos are very interesting objects too so if i ask you which would lead to better heating you know suppose you are trying to cook an omelet uh, you put your frying pan and your you know scrambled egg uh, on your uh, frying pan and you put this frying pan on the footpath you know where sunlight is falling of course you know mumbai is hot but it's not as hot perhaps we are you know willing to go to somewhere in rajasthan maybe let's say jaisalmer and perhaps let's grant that would that footpath be hotter than the surface of sun but where we don't count the heat coming from photons or electrons or any of those things only the heat due to neutrinos 
turns out, even though the sun emits so many neutrinos, the heating due to solar radiation at the Earth's surface, you know, on a footpath, as I say, is more efficient than the heating due to neutrinos at the surface of the sun. So neutrinos are very, 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 very weakly interacting particles. They just pass through you. They don't deposit heat. So when these two opposites come together, you know, on one hand, the supernova is producing a huge number of neutrinos. On the other hand, these neutrinos don't interact at all. This is one of those classic stories where, you know, you are talking about, uh, you know, there are these uh, funny uh, words like immovable force and uh, so immovable object and, uh, you know, infinite force and such and such. It's a zero times infinity kind of an object. So in such situations, it's very tricky to understand what is going to go on. For example, if I ask you, well, supernova makes such a large number of neutrinos, but none of those neutrinos are supposed to interact. What happens to some object that is outside the supernova? Does it see any interactions or not? Because if you increase the number of neutrinos coming, you increase the chance of seeing a neutrino. But on the other hand, neutrinos don't interact at all. So where exactly is the balance stuck? Turns out, in this case, the answer is very simple. We will see that supernovae are such intense sources of neutrinos that they will practically blind us. You know, not literally. You will not go blind by looking at a supernova. But I mean that detectors, you know, our physics, particle physics detectors that are looking at supernova have a chance of getting overloaded with neutrinos uh, if, the, if these supernova happen relatively close to the Earth. So we will talk about that in a second. But the main point I want to make is that there is this battle of extremes, lots of neutrinos versus their very weak interactions. And that's why supernova neutrinos, one of the reasons why supernova neutrinos are very interesting. This is also very important because neutrinos being very weakly interacting particles, they escape from very dense regions. And so therefore, to study the interior of stars, there is no other option other than maybe gravitational waves, uh, but to use neutrinos. Uh, for supernovae, this neutrino signal can be very high, as I just told you. And this is one of the few places where neutrinos interact with other neutrinos. Unfortunately, I will not have time to talk about this in more detail, although this is one of my favorite subjects. Uh, just if uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm just going to mention that this is something that is very underappreciated. We all know that there is some theory called the standard model that predicts all possible interactions that we know of. But it predicts one interaction that has not yet been measured, at least not directly. And that is between two neutrinos. And supernovae allow you to make that measurement. Okay. But, okay. but before we proceed, I just want to make one clarification. There are two kinds of supernovae, broadly speaking. You will see lots of different types here, but roughly there is something called type 1a and the rest. The type 1a supernovae are those which are hydrogen bomb. You know, a star makes helium by burning hydrogen. If it tries to do it too efficiently or just too much, then the star just explodes. This is a thermonuclear supernova. This is called a type 1a supernova. Other supernovae happen because they run out of fuel and then they collapse and this collapse gets turned outwards into an explosion. And this is called a core collapse supernova. So we are going to talk about core collapse supernova, which is what makes, neutrino, uh, makes neutrinos. The thermonuclear supernovae do not make neutrinos. These core collapse supernovae are the one that make neutron stars and black holes, for example. Okay, so but just a little bit more about thermonuclear supernova. So it happens because one of the stars, let's say a white dwarf, uh, steals gas from a red giant, and then the white dwarf overheats and just goes supernova. Uh, that's what is being shown here. And these are the kind of exploding stars, supernovae, that are used to measure cosmological distances. And, the, and for this, you know, there have been Nobel Prizes. It's a very important thing, but this is not the topic of our talk today. We are talking about core collapse supernovae, where a star you know, burns hydrogen, then burns helium, then carbon, other things. Eventually, there is a central core of the star that becomes made of iron. And iron cannot undergo fusion or fission 
or it's not efficiently at least. And therefore that iron core starts collapsing. And once it collapses, it just, you know, everything above the star starts falling inwards gravitationally. And then everything goes uh, towards the center. It, you know, interacts with itself. This collapse gets turned outward hydrodynamically into a shock wave. This shock wave proceeds outwards and you know, explodes the star. So there's a little bit more subtlety to this story. We will come to it. But roughly speaking, this end of life collapse turning out into an explosion, that's this core, core collapse supernova. And in this phase of shockwave going out, lots of reactions, chemical, nuclear reactions happen, which make neutrinos. And these are the neutrinos that we will try to observe. These supernovae have been historically observed. Uh, this is one of the uh, Chinese records of a supernova that happened in 1054. There are lots of other supernovae. You can see they, these numbers after the supernovae tell which year they were observed in. And these are all the supernovae that were observed in our galaxy. Okay, So as you can see, I mean, the record goes back all the way to basically 2000 years ago or so. And there are about maybe 10 of them. So not a lot. So you could ask, how often do these things happen? So the estimates vary. This is not something that is very well measured yet. And people believe that the number of supernovae that happen in a galaxy like the Milky Way, roughly between one and three times per century. So somewhere in this range. And so then you could ask, what is then the probability that I will see one of these supernovae go off in the galaxy in my lifetime, let's say another 50 years or so. It turns out you can't really estimate that very well because when the rate is very small, let's say once or twice or three times per century, you are in the regime of what is called Poisson statistics. And then this has a very wide variation. You know, you could have a supernova tomorrow and the one, then another one day after, and then nothing for 300 years. All of these things are possible. So our natural notion of you know, typical time after which a supernova will happen is not a very good one when the statistics are so low, when the rate is so low. So we have to look. Of course, in our neighborhood, in our neighborhood, there are a lot of supernovae. So, for example, this is the supernova per decade on the y-axis, and this is distance from us. And you can see roughly two per decade are happening. Roughly, you can see about two, two supernova per decade. So once every five years, you are seeing a supernova in the neighborhood, you know, up to about 10 megabars. That's not a small number. And if you look cosmologically, you can again find some number of supernova. It basically says, some number per year per megaparsec cube, and that number is of the order of 10 power minus 4 or so, okay, as a function of redshift. So the rate that you get roughly is 1 to 3 supernova, again that same number, per century, but now in this case, per 10 billion solar luminosities, which means that you take a volume which has 10 billion solar luminosities, and then this is the rate. Okay, so, so I've told you that there are supernovae that are happening in the galaxy, just outside the galaxy, cosmologically, and they have certain rates, not very large, maybe once, maybe twice, maybe three times per century, more like maybe once or twice. So it's a rare event. But let me tell you about an interesting candidate. So there is a star called Betelgeuse. It's a red supergiant. It has 18 times the mass of the sun. And it's about a thousand times larger in diameter. And it is only 640 light years away. You know, I say only because, you know, in astronomical terms, it's not a very large distance. It's not kiloparsecs or anything, just light years, 640 light years away. It's a very close by, very big star. Once it goes a supernova, which it is supposed to within another 0.1 to 1 million years, it will be brighter than the moon and it will be visible during the day for two to three months. So it's a it's a pretty uh, it's a it's a pretty interesting event that is going to happen. Maybe may, may not be in our lifetimes. Again, we don't know for sure. 
Uh, I'm sure many of you have figured out where Betelgeuse is in this picture, but just in case you haven't, here it is. It's a red super giant. So the red star here is the Betelgeuse. Okay. The typical distance of a supernova from us is something like eight kiloparsecs or so, just in case there are people who aren't aware of these units. A parsec is 3.26 light year and kiloparsec is just 1000 parsec. Okay. So the typical distance of a supernova from us is about 8 kiloparsecs. And you can see where Betelgeuse is. Betelgeuse is at 0.2. And we have a lot of neutrino detectors. I'll not tell you too much about them, uh, but they are spread all over the world. Lots of different kinds of detectors looking at neutrinos, and they will observe, you know, different numbers of neutrinos depending on their sizes and their detection mechanisms. But the most important one of them, in my opinion, at least, is uh, this experiment called Super K, which will see about ten thousand neutrinos from a supernova in our galaxy, and ice cube, which we will encounter again at the end of the talk, which we'll see about a million of them. But this one is a bit different, the ice cube. And then there are lots of other future detectors which are coming up. Different numbers of uh, events are expected for each of them. Some of them detect electron neutrinos, some of them others. It's a very big, interesting uh, exercise. Let, let me tell you an interesting story. So Vandana is our host here today. Uh, she told me that today in my introduction, she will say that she was my teacher, which she was. Uh, when I joined TIFR as a student in 2003, uh, I actually worked for about a week in her lab where she taught us uh, that there are certain nuclear, uh, whatever, radioactive uh, decays where, you know, two gamma photons are emitted in quick succession, let's say. And this is very nice because you can get one photon coming just out of nowhere, just background. But to have two photons with a very fixed time separation between them, that's uh, a very unique signature. So you can look for that. And uh, using you know, precise measurements of this time difference, you can also learn about interesting things. So this is, this is something that had stayed with me. And it turns out that there's a very important measurement in neutrino physics that uses the same principle. I mean, if it had not already been discovered before I started doing my PhD, maybe I could have used the idea that Vandana taught us. Uh, but here it is. The idea is that when an electron antineutrino hits a proton, it makes a positron, which is shown here. And this positron is traveling faster than light in that medium, let's say water. And so it makes a Cherenkov cone, you know, which is what is shown here. Now, this Cherenkov cone you observe. Because you know, it's photons, you can observe. But this proton gets converted to a neutron, and the neutron is usually not observed. Okay. But if you put gadolinium in your water, any gadolinium salt, then this neutron is absorbed by the gadolinium, and then the gadolinium excites and de excites and emits some photons. And now you have two signals this is signal one, and this is signal two, and there is a well-known relationship between these two signals. So instead of having just one blip signal, you now have a heartbeat signal, a blip, blip. Now these two successive signals with some well-known relationship between them allows you to cut down background a lot. This is something that is now being done. Uh, Super K, this detector that I just uh, told you about in Japan, uh, added this gadolinium salt over the last summer and uh, it is actually going to take, take benefit of this idea. So this is something which is very useful to cut down backgrounds. Okay, so supernova neutrinos, have they been observed? I've told you a lot about it, but have we observed them? Yes, they have been observed once in 1987. Three different detectors. So this is the precursor of Super Kamiokande. This, is, this was called Kamiokande, this is in Japan. Irwin, Michigan, Brookhaven. This is an experiment in USA. And this is an experiment in Russia, Baksan. What is shown on the axis is the time after the first event. And then 
this is zero, you can see for each of them. And on the y-axis is the energy of these events. You can see there are about 20 events that have been seen in three detectors. And in this case on the right is an event display. You know? So these red dots that you see, see this blue cylinder is the water tank, which acts as the detector. The neutrino comes in from outside, let's say something like this would have, yeah, exactly. You see there's this plus sign and an arrow. This is where the neutrino came in. And then this neutrino came in, the positron was produced roughly in that same direction. And as a result, there was this Cherenkov cone that is shown here like this. And these dots that you see here, these are the photons or C. It's just one of the events out of around uh, 12 or so that uh, Camille Grande saw. And using this cone, you can even point back towards the uh, you know, direction from which the neutrino came in. Turns out that it's not particularly uh, good at uh, you know determining the location, but good enough to say that it could have come from this supernova 87, which exploded around 23rd of February 1987. That I think that was the date. Oh yeah, exactly. That's 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 the. Basu, uh, Basu, okay. sorry, this is another. Basu, yeah. Yeah. sorry to Go interrupt you. Voice seems to be losing in between. I see. Uh, is it better now? Yeah, I mean, it's there. Sometimes it is going because I also got a comment also YouTube as well as here as well. So I think maybe when you are trying to do something, draw and all that, it, it goes just okay. Let's try to see. I, see. I hope okay, so I'm sorry. I, I'm not yeah. moving. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Nice yeah, it happens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if, if, the, if, if something important is missed, just ask me to repeat. Sure. Okay. So this is another view of those same supernova 1987 events in Super K. This is hand drawn by none other than Suzuki himself. And on the x-axis is the time. And uh, on, on these four panels are the neutrinos that were you know, detected in four different detectors. So these are the ones that are important. So let me skip over a few slides. I don't think they're very important here. So we have seen neutrinos from supernovae, one of them at least, but there is a different way of looking for neutrinos from supernovae, which is not from individually from each supernova that's happening somewhere, but rather the sum total aggregate of all neutrinos coming from all supernova explosions happening all over the universe. This will create a diffuse background of neutrinos Okay. And that's something that we are hoping to discover. It has not been discovered yet. And this is called the DSNB or the Diffuse Supernova Neutrino Background. And uh, it is my understanding and opinion that uh, in the next decade or so, this might be one of the major discoveries in neutrino telescopes like SuperK, especially now that gadolinium has been added. So this is something that we should keep an eye out for the discovery of the diffuse background of neutrinos due to supernova explosions. Okay. And so as a result, uh, we need to have a very different kind of strategy for the different kinds of things that we can see. If you have a supernova in the galaxy, you know, which happens about once a century, you will get lots of neutrinos. So you need big detectors to do this. On the other hand, if you're looking at the sum total of neutrinos from you know, all over the universe, that's the diffuse background it should happen basically one or two events every uh, year you should see. And in between are supernovae that are happening in the neighborhood in about a megaparsec or so around us. Uh, this is hard to detect. At, as of now, there is no known or practical way of detecting these neutrinos. These two are more or less in the bag. And why are neutrinos? Was interesting. One of the most interesting things about neutrinos is that they are the reason why the supernova explodes. As I told you, there's this shock wave that goes out, but this shock wave actually does, does not have enough energy 
to go through the entire star. Neutrinos that are being emitted from the inner part of the supernova have to deposit their energy behind the shock wave and heat the shock from within, and which is what powers you know, this shock wave outwards. It is not fully understood how this happens. This is a topic of research and something that I am very interested in as well. Uh, and this idea that neutrinos heat the shock is called the neutrino mechanism. And this is the leading explanation, the most you know, uh, favored explanation for why supernova explosions happen. But this is not something that has been established observationally. It is my opinion and belief that upcoming neutrino experiments with observations of supernova neutrinos can shed very valuable light on this 100-year-old problem that how do stars explode? Okay, so let me again skip over some of these details and move directly to high energy neutrinos. Okay. So, so far I've told you a little bit about supernova neutrinos. These are stars about 10 to 15 times more massive than the sun. They run out of their fuel and the iron core collapses in the middle. The collapse is turned outwards exactly like a rubber ball that bounces outwards. And then this creates a shock wave, a density wave moving outwards, which explodes the star most likely due to neutrinos heating this density wave from below. That's the story. And then we want to detect these neutrinos. There are lots of different detectors and you can use many clever tricks to detect these neutrinos. I told you about one of them using gadolinium. And that's the story. And why do we want to do that? Because we want to study supernovae. We want to study neutrinos. We want to study how neutrinos and supernovae interact and so on. Now we will switch gears. Now, we will move to a new different story. The story of high energy neutrinos. Neutrinos coming from black holes. It's my pleasure to be able to give this talk and say that these things have been detected. Have I, if I had uh, given this talk five years ago, I would not have been able to do so. So only in, I think, 2018, we could confidently claim that we have detected neutrinos from these kind of sources. So this name is given here. These very funny names, you know, astronomers give to the things that they're seeing. Um, so some of the names I will try to explain to you, not this one. So supernova 1987A because it was the first supernova of 1987. And this is how the names are usually given. In this case, it's a bit different. Okay. But before we talk about high energy neutrinos, we have to rewind the tape a little bit and go back to a different topic. The topic of cosmic rays. This is a topic that must be very close to many members of TIFR and uh, the Indian astroparticle physics community. Uh, this is the topic, uh, you know, which was of close interest to Omi Bhabha. And uh, you know, this is a topic on which great work, you know, world-class Nobel Prize level work has been done in India. You know, discovery of atmospheric neutrinos, uh, one of them. Uh, so it's, it's a very nice thing that uh, you know, this very modern day topic that we are going to talk about, high energy neutrinos from AGNs and these cosmic accelerators, is directly connected to something that we are very good at already. And so there is an opportunity there for us in India to begin to make contributions to this very exciting area of high energy neutrinos. So, but OK, let's go back to cosmic rays. So it was observed by Hess uh, that he found that there are energetic particles that ionize air. Here he is in a hot air balloon going up. And there are many questions like, do they come from the earth or do they come from space? Are these gamma rays or are these charged particles? All sorts of questions about them. So this, this has been the story that there are all these very highly energetic penetrating particles that are found, especially if you go up in the atmosphere. And we want to understand where are these coming from? What are they made of? 
and uh, what are their different properties. So this is the field of cosmic rays. Now, in the last hundred years or so, a lot of progress has been made. And what we know is that not only are there these particles, that these, these particles actually span a very wide range of energies. They span a very wide range of energies. And what is shown here on the x-axis is the energy per particle. On the y-axis is flux in some units. And you can see that for low energies, so as you can see this is 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14 electron volt per particle. So this is already at TV here. Okay. And this is roughly where LHC, the Large Hadron Collider energies are. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, well, if you're looking at... Uh, uh, sorry. Basu, I think we are again losing your voice. Two particles, then... Okay, am I audible now? Yeah. Is this better now? Yes, yeah, little better. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I uh, in any case, I said. Okay, good. Uh, so as I was saying, on the x-axis is energy per particle. Okay, and on the upper x-axis, this one, oops, this one, is the energy that you would see if two of these particles collided head-on with each other. Okay. So, as you will then see that the energies that are expected of present day lab experiments are somewhere over here. This is LHC. But these particles span energies that are both much smaller and much larger. And there's some features that are seen here that they're, they're given interesting names. This feature, this bend here in the spectrum is called the knee. Then there is something called the ankle. And then at the very end, here, the flux is so low that we don't really know what's going on. Okay, it is a, it is predicted that there is a you know cutoff that the flux cannot extend beyond this because it gets absorbed by the cosmic microwave background. Okay. Uh, we are going to talk about particles that are roughly of energy which is about. Uh, uh, 10 PeV or so, so around 10 to the 16 electron volt in neutrino energy. And we'll see where they come from. These are cosmic rays. They're not neutrinos. Charged cosmic rays, we will see what they are. They're charged particles. It was not known what kind of charged particles they are. They could be protons. They could be ions, you know, iron nuclei, let's say some charged version of them. It, that could be cosmic rays. Uh, we don't know. But first question that we have to answer is that where are these charged particles coming from and how are they being you know, sped up to such high energies? So again, one of the first ideas in this field came from the legendary Enrico Fermi, who happens to be my advisor's 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 advisor, I think. Uh, so I'm very happy to be connected in some way to him. Uh, he was one of the last uh, physicists who was both an experimentalist and a theorist. So great inspiration uh, for me at least. Um, and he found this technique of how moving clouds, you know, so imagine that there's some cloud that's moving with some velocity would lead to acceleration of a particle that entered the cloud, scattered a little bit and exited it. And <clears throat> he found that the energy increase was proportional to the square of the velocity of the cloud. Okay, and this is called second order Fermi acceleration. This is from his notebook. But this is not very efficient because then if the cloud is moving with some, so there's of course always a you know speed of light in the denominator. So as long as this ratio is small, the energy gain is not very much. So later on, the he all discovered a more efficient version of this acceleration called the first order Fermi acceleration, where these particles pass forward and backwards of a shock wave, which is shown here. And in this case, the energy gain, delta E over E, is proportional to the, ener the ener velocity difference across the shock, which can be pretty large. So it's linear. And again, you divide by speed of light C, it becomes dimensionless. Okay. And this is more efficient. 
and it requires several centuries to accelerate particles from ordinary energies to this TeV energies that we are talking about. But you know, centuries are nothing for astrophysics. So it does happen. The particles get accelerated. So this is just one slide of a little bit of uh, math. Uh, I could not. Uh, I, I could not. I. I I could not resist uh, putting this slide in because it's just one of those beautiful things that you can do just based on uh, 11th and 12th level uh, you know calculus so what are we trying to say that we are trying to say that the spectrum of charged particles is going to have some sort of a power law in energy you know which we have already seen we have already seen that as a on a log log scale there are these straight lines Okay, so there are these power laws. There is, a, you know, power law changes at some point, but nevertheless, for very long, you know, stretches in energy, you can see very clean power laws. Why do these power laws exist? And the answer is very simple. So imagine that the energy gain, you know, rate of change of energy, you know, dE dt, is some energy divided by some typical time on which energy is gained. So e by t. Dimensionally, this is correct, right? dE dt is energy by time and then energy by time. And let us assume that the number of particles of that energy are changing in some given volume at some rate. dF dt is equal to minus of f divided by the typical loss time scale. As soon as we have written these two equations, I can divide the second one, the second equation by the first one. This is equation two, and the df by de is then going to become this object. And anyone who's you know gone through eleventh and twelfth level calculus can then immediately see that the solution for this equation is going to be something like that: the f, this number of particles with energy e, is going to be something like energy to the sum power, and this alpha depends on this ratio of times. So it's a power law, and then if you want to know how many number, you know, f is some distribution, and then if you want to know the number, you have to integrate over energy, and you get d and d e, the number of neutrinos or number of particles, let's say charged particles per unit energy, uh, is some power of energy. So this is how these power laws come in. It's a simple explanation, and. these charged particles how what, what exactly is going on very roughly you can imagine that if there is a magnetic field you know which is let's say pointing in some direction upwards there is a charged particle that's you know going with some velocity v it has some charge q then you know you know that it goes on in some circle which is given by this gyration radius and so you need some distance r within which the magnetic field must must exist in order to contain the particle this is what is captured by this plot called the hilas criteria it says that let's plot the sizes of objects on the x axis and their magnetic fields on the y axis and these different colored blobs are different objects so for example intergalactic medium is very large but it has a very small magnetic field on the other hand something like a white dwarf has this size you know some million meters or so and it has a magnetic field which is about 1000 tesla and the other objects here and given this you can find out what is the maximum energy that you can accelerate a particle to in such a source because once the energy goes beyond something it will just escape you know initially it goes like this and then eventually it escapes once the energy becomes larger and so this is the maximum energy and one can see that you know these lines that are drawn give you a sense of what this maximum energy is this for example this this line corresponds to the energy of the knee of that cosmic ray spectrum this one is at the ankle and this is at the end of that spectrum the gzk cutoff as well. this is a simplistic thing and there are lots of caveats but, but let me you know not talk about that we are ending the hour so about 10 more minutes to go uh, so let me quickly 
move to the last topic that I want to talk about. So we have so far talked about cosmic rays. We have not talked about high energy neutrinos. But what we what we needed to do that because at the end, if you want a very high energy neutrino, how are you going to get it? Neutrinos do not have charge. So they cannot be accelerated directly. What can happen is that you accelerate a charged particle, which then interacts with something, let's say a proton, and makes pions. And these pions then make neutrinos. We, and these new pions are very highly energetic. And when they decay in flight, they produce neutrinos, which are also highly energetic. So this is one of the mechanisms with which you can make high energy neutrinos. And one possible place where this can happen is something called a blazar. These are basically black holes. Let me draw again. These are black holes at the center, which are spinning and stuff is falling into this black hole. This thing is called the accretion disk. And along the axis of spin, roughly, stuff is you know, going out in a jet. In these jets, there are shock waves and first order Fermi acceleration can happen, for example, for charged particles. And then these charged particles, let's say protons, can interact with another proton, with, let's say within the jet itself or somewhere in the environment. And they can make neutrinos, which then go in the forward direction. And then these are the neutrinos then that you observe. And I use the term blazers, depending on which direction this object is seen at. Uh, the, you know, these have different names. If you see it side on, it is called a radio galaxy. If you see it at a small angle, it is a radio loud quasar. If you see it along the jet, it's called a blazer. Okay? So these are just different names astronomers give to the same object. The jet of an active galactic nuclei pointed towards the observer. This is called a blazer. And then the particles are accelerated in the jet. These particles make neutrinos, which is what you observe. There are two kinds of things that can happen. One is that you accelerate protons. The other is that you accelerate electrons. If you accelerate electrons, it turns out that no neutrinos are produced. You know, this does, does not make neutrinos. No neutrons. But if you accelerate protons, then you make neutrinos. Okay. And this has also been one of the puzzles that which of these two particles are being accelerated in these objects. And if you detect neutrinos, then you can be sure that protons are being accelerated. So that's also one of the reasons why we want to detect these high energy neutrons. So I'll skip some of these uh, in detail. Uh, these are estimates of how many neutrinos should be produced, what energies should they have, and so on. So let me skip all of that. Uh, one thing is that neutrinos at these high energies are good messengers because from very far away distances, other particles would typically get absorbed or deflected away. But neutrinos, you know, they travel along straight lines because they have no charge, they don't interact very much. And so that's a very uh, good thing that you can detect. Uh, so you can detect very far away objects using neutrons. What, what is being shown here on the x-axis is energy, on the y-axis is uh, distance of the uh, distance of uh, the object being looked at. And this black region is where the universe is opaque to photons, but transparent to neutrinos. So, you know, this region you can only see using neutrinos, you know, this entire black region. That's a great thing about neutrinos. And so this is now an updated version of that same cosmic ray uh, plot. Some of uh, the neutrino data is also plotted here. Uh, let me not go into this, rather, let me finish by telling you one of the greatest success stories in the last five years, which is the detector detection of these high energy neutrinos in this experiment called Ice Cube. So Ice Cube is a, an experiment that exists in Antarctica. Uh, it is 
three kilometers underneath the ground, which is made of ice in Antarctica. And you drill holes, 86 of them, about three kilometers deep. In each of these holes, you know, which are about a meter or two, or maybe five meters wide, these holes, you lower a cable where you put optic, you know, these digital optical modules. These are photomultiplier tubes. And then there are about, I think, 5,000 of these detectors, you know, which are shown here. All of this is your detector. And now, and then there's ice everywhere around. So when there's a neutrino that comes from outside, it interacts through, let's say, a proton, let's say, new E bar comes from outside, interacts with the proton in the ice. It will again make this E plus, which is this positron, which will make the Cherenkov radiation, which can then be seen by my detectors. And this is how we will know that we saw a neutrino. So this is the principle of this experiment. And different kinds of shapes of events will be seen depending on which kind of particle is coming in and what interaction uh, is responsible for making the event. Again, I will skip these details. Uh, I just need to also mention that there are gamma ray telescopes in the sky, which are also looking at high energy gamma rays. Uh, this will come in in one second. Let me just skip over all these things. The main point was that over the last 10 years, this high energy neutrinos and high energy cosmic ray field has been very, very active. And there are a whole bunch of different experiments, some of which I just skipped and I did not uh, tell you about. Magic, Fermi, Veritas, Hess, a whole bunch of them. They have been looking for these high energy neutrinos and charged particles. And it was hoped that there will be some sort of a coincident observation of neutrinos and cosmic rays from the same part of the sky so that we will know that there is some source that is making cosmic rays and neutrinos. And in doing so, we would then confirm that, new, that the acceleration mechanism is hydronic, which is to say that protons are accelerated in these sources and that is what makes up cosmic rays, for example. So this has been a long-standing dream in this field to do so. Uh, things only started looking nice after 2012 or so. In 2012, the first few events were seen, which were at this energy of approximately one peta electron volt, so 10 to the 15 electron volt. And at that time, it was not fully understood where they're coming from. Some of us uh, even tried to interpret uh, where they were from. One of the interpretations we gave was that these are astrophysical cosmic neutrinos. And indeed, uh, you know, almost uh, at the same time, uh, other people, Ice Cube, all these detectors, they confirmed that, uh, yes, these neutrinos that are being seen are most likely coming from very far away cosmological distances. And this was then seen as the breakthrough of the year uh, by Physics World. This was on the cover of the science magazine. It was a very big result in 2013. The field has progressed a lot in these last seven years. The number of these PV neutron event events has now gone to something like 10 or 15. I don't exactly remember the number, but it has increased to you know well beyond the first two events that were seen. And now there's a whole bunch of different strategies that are in place to simultaneously observe uh, any source in neutrinos and cosmic rays. It had not happened. So the strategies were in place and all these different people got together. Let's just skip. I wanted to tell you some stories, but there is no time for that. But the punchline of the story is the following. About three years ago, 43 seconds after Ice Cube saw some interesting looking events in its de neutrino detector, it sent out a telegram to the rest of the astronomy community. And I'm just showing you that telegram. And immediately, a whole bunch of other uh, detectors, they turned and started looking at that particular direction of the sky. And Many of these other telegrams then say that no detection, no detection, no detection, no detection. But then Fermi telescope found gamma ray activity in the same direction. 
Okay, and then so did magic, another chair in cocktail as well. So now what had happened within a few weeks, I guess, of Ice Cube seeing these neutrino events is that a gamma ray telescope and a Cherenkov telescope had seen charged particles making gamma rays from the same direction. And so this was, of course, very exciting. I got excited too. Uh, you can see this is how theoretical physicists behave when they are expecting exciting news coming from experimentalists. Uh, so before the day this announcement was going to be made, um, you know, I was uh, very excited and I wanted to, you know, catch the attention of some, some of my experimentalist friends, uh, just in case they had some inside scoop to give me. Uh, unfortunately, no one told me anything that I did not know because they are sworn by secrecy in these sort of situations. But within a day, we learned that magic telescope had discovered gamma rays from the same direction from which Ice Cube had seen neutrinos. So this was a very, very big deal. You know, you know, big announcement, the first joint detection of neutrinos and gamma rays. And this is the holy grail, because if this has happened, then we have at least for this one case established that charged particles that are accelerated in these high energy accelerators out there in the sky are accelerating protons or ions, not just electrons. And in doing so, we have established the origin of these neutrinos. Now, this is all very good if it is true. Turns out the truth is a little bit more subtle. The detection is not completely reliable. So it's what we would call in our language three sigma. It's not five sigma. So it's a good promising start. It's good evidence, but we need more data to 100% tie these two things together. There are a bunch of reasons why other detectors did not see it, uh, but uh, this is the Fermi Lat and Ice Cube seeing it at the same time. There's a worldwide effort. I think even uh, some Indian uh, uh, telescopes uh, tried looking at it using AstroSat. Uh, nothing interesting was seen by AstroSat as far as I know. Uh, interestingly, once this discovery was made, Ice Cube looked at its archival data, old data, from the same direction and found more events, which gave a little bit more uh, uh, evidence. But uh, still, you know, what I would say is that this is an area where we need a little bit more data to be 100% sure that we have understood the relationship between neutrinos and cosmic rays. I think that there is still scope for better understanding of this physics. But we can certainly say that there is very tantalizing evidence that Texas 0506, this source, emitted charged particles and neutrinos uh, roughly around the same epoch in the same direction. And we were able to observe both of these using a variety of different experiments. So that's a great, great um, achievement. Um, some people uh, even feel that this might get a Nobel Prize sometime soon. Um, and I, I think this is a very interesting uh, thing to keep an eye out. So if you're interested in neutrinos, I would say that the two most interesting things about neutrinos are first is that we are going to detect these diffuse supernova neutrino background that I told you about at the beginning of my talk. So let me skip over all these. Now supernova 87A that we saw in 87 was just the first step. And now we have to detect the diffuse supernova neutrino background and maybe even more supernova from our own galaxy. Now that's what I would say is number one priority. And second is that we have detected these neutrinos from you know this high energy blazer with this name. Uh, but this is again a field where more statistics will give us much better understanding of the connection between neutrinos and high energy cosmic rays. And in the next decade, we will learn a lot more about both of these things. So with that, I will stop. Thanks. Thank you, Basu, for a very, very nice talk. You said impossible dream, but uh, your talk has shown how things are possible with the neutrino astronomy. 
you have conveyed the excitement of the field to all our viewers and there have been many on the YouTube. And uh, particularly, I think it's as you pointed out, there have been already a lot of Nobel Prizes in uh, neutrino physics and more will come soon. So that's uh, very nice. Before I open for questions, I'll make a, one small comment since you talked about uh, uh, doing a pro experiment in our lab. So yes, I uh, do recall that and I would just highlight that this is again something which is the role of the TIFA graduate school, what we learn in the graduate studies goes long ways in what research we do. Yeah, I see uh, some hands raised in uh, Zoom, but maybe for a change, we'll take first a couple of questions from YouTube and then come back to Zoom. There was a question from Abhinav Choudhury. He has two questions. One is, uh, why do neutrino oscillations take place and do all the neutrino types oscillate into all other types? Okay, uh, maybe I can answer that question. So I, today I did not uh, talk about neutrino oscillations uh, very deliberately because that's a whole different talk. And I think Indumati has talked a little bit about it in the last talk. Yeah. So I focused my attention today on the fact that neutrinos exist. They are very light. They do not interact. And you can use these light non-interacting particles to study far away stellar objects. It turns out, yes, that neutrinos oscillate. They are, all neutrinos oscillate amongst each other. Any neutrino can go to any other neutrino. Different rates, of course. Uh, yeah, that's a different uh, interesting topic, uh, but not for today. Can you stop sharing your screen, Basu? Yes, yes. Because we're getting a double your pictures. Yeah. So Abhinav has one more question. Um, he says, do neutrinos interact differently with matter than antimatter? Okay, very good question. Do neutrinos interact differently with matter as opposed to antimatter? Uh, yes, but I have to qualify that answer in a certain sense. So you see, electron interacts differently with matter than antimatter. No? So electron and another electron will repel. But electron and the anti-electron, which is the positron, will attract. And in fact, they will annihilate each other and make photons. So even for non-confusing, you know, simple things like electrons, we understand that interactions with antimatter are going to be of a different kind. So of course, neutrinos also share that same property. Interactions with antimatter are of a totally different kind. But if you are asking the question that do neutrinos exhibit CP violation? This would be, I think, uh, the more uh, subtle version of this question. The answer is we don't know yet. We, uh, you know, we are trying to find out. Okay, uh, there's uh, one more question which says you mentioned a cosmic accelerator. Basu, we lost your voice again. No, I am here. No, no, we lost the voice. Yeah, yeah, okay. Is uh, it better now? Yeah. Uh, so there's one more question. You mentioned the cosmic accelerator. What is the name of the co cosmic accelerator? I see. No, so this, I am sorry. I apologize. I, I, you know, this is uh, just a figure of speech. Uh, there are lots of different astronomical objects. Let's say spinning black holes where stuff is falling into it, making these jets even just spinning stars, in all of these objects, it is expected that charged particles can be accelerated using roughly the same principles as the accelerators on Earth. We call these astrophysical objects which accelerate particles cosmic accelerators. We don't give them separate names. Of course, the different kinds of objects have different names. So these spinning black holes at the centers of galaxies which make these jets, these are called active galactic nuclei, AGMs, if you like acronyms. Whereas there are stars that rotate and explode, you know, something called gamma ray bursts, uh, magnetars, uh, all kinds of different astronomical objects. Uh, they have their names, um, but it's not like the LHC or, uh, you know, Rick that, you know, each of these has a name. Well, some of them do. I showed you one of them, this Blazar 170922. That's the name of that particular accelerator, if you want uh, to have a name. Uh, I hope that answers your question. 
Okay, uh, I'll come to Zoom uh, and uh, Vivek Data has a question. Vivek, you can ask your question. Yeah, okay. You the also question, had a comment. Maybe you can say that. Yeah, also. I have one comment and a question. Uh, the question is that uh, this event of 2017, uh, where you saw both high energy photons as well as uh, a high energy neutrino event, uh, did people also look for gravitational wave signal in that uh, same event? I forget. Was it? I have forgotten. I, I mean, this is three years ago, and I have forgotten. Uh, uh, but I think they looked and did not find. Okay. Okay. So was it because it, the, the sensitivity of the uh, gravitational wave detector was too low for this event, or or not really? Uh, Again, I don't remember the details. But my guess is that even if, let's say, present day fully functional LIGO Virgo. Uh, was present at that time, it would be totally consistent to not detect any gravitational waves because gravitational wave signature come from, you know, quadrupolar anisotropy. Yeah, that's right. So is it that and this is a very, uh, I mean, spherically symmetric object that we have? We don't know. I, I don't okay. think there's any data to say anything. Okay. I, I okay, don't think... Comment, that, uh, yeah. Okay, so fine. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's an answer. Fine. Uh, I, yeah. The comment is regarding this uh, cosmic relic neutrinos that uh, you know that might excite some of the young people because that is a completely open problem, and there are people who are uh, trying yes. to think of ways of detecting these cosmic relic neutrinos. Yes. Uh, in fact, there is one group I think in uh, the US, but it's a big collaboration anyway. Yes. That is going to use tritium, a huge amount of tritium. I think something like a thousand times Amen. what Catherine is going to uh, Catherine is using right now. For measuring the absolute mass of the electron yes. so that's a completely open area. If somebody has a very good idea on this, I think that would be just fantastic. Yes. Just as cosmic Actually, microwave what background Vivek, was uh, yeah. Says, uh, yeah, what Vivek says is very important here. Uh, the first picture on my universe of neutrinos slide, the one on the very left, where I said it was of a temperature one hundredth of a milli electron volt. Yeah. You know, which has only been indirectly detected using cosmology. Um, that's the neutrinos that Vivek is talking about. So these are neutrinos produced in the Big Bang. And they right now have such low, basically no good ideas on how to detect them. Uh, the idea that Vivek is talking about is an experiment called Ptolemy. Uh, and uh, it is a collaboration of, I think, some Princeton University people and some people in Naples. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's a great idea, but uh, I think there are formidable challenges uh, for that experiment uh, to actually be built because it's, it's a huge amount of tritium uh, and we don't know how that has to be done. But that is basically exactly the reason why that field I think is very interesting is that there is a huge opportunity to detect something that is fundamentally new. It will be a big test of cosmology, standard cosmology, if those neutrinos are seen. Um, we have quite a few questions on YouTube. So we will try to go through them maybe a bit quickly so yes, we sir. can have short answers. So uh, one of the questions is how supernova size is measured? Supernova size. So by size, if you mean mass, uh, the mass of a supernova can be measured, for example, by the amount of light that is seen uh, in the explosion. Neutrinos also provide a very good way of measuring uh, the mass of the supernova. Okay. You know, the well, amount of neutrinos quick. that you see. Sorry. So one more question is, are there more than three known types of neutrino and how heavy is a single neutrino? Okay, good question. So you're asking uh, how many neutrinos are there and what are their masses? So, so far we know of three neutrinos. Uh, there are talks of having more than three neutrinos, but I don't, I, the, the evidence for that is not yet compelling. The masses are not known. So I could say the following that there are three neutrinos. The lowest neutrino mass, the lightest one, we don't know what its mass exactly is, but it is somewhere between zero and one electron volt. Zero is allowed, it can't be less than zero, and maximum can be approximately one. 
and then the, the, the spacings between these other neutrinos is known, uh, roughly of the order of one hundredth of an electron volt and one thousandth of an electron volt or so. Uh, but basically, the way to remember it is that all three neutrinos could be almost massless, like much less than an electron volt. And they could be approximately all a fraction of an electron volt in mass. That's the range. Okay. Um, one more question from Subodh Kumar Godre: If neutrinos happen to be massless, can they fall in a black hole? Oh, of course. Uh, I mean, so neutrinos are not massless. First of all, we know that at least two of them are not massless. Uh, but nevertheless, you know. photons light is massless and it falls in a black hole so what stops a neutron from falling in a black hole okay um one more question from yogesh gupta how do you differentiate among neutrinos coming from different sources in the universe that's a very good question that's an excellent uh, question how do you distinguish between neutrinos coming from different sources in the universe if you can measure the direction from which this neutrino came from then that gives you some indication so suppose you know you, in your lab you are detecting some neutrinos that are coming from the direction of the sun then you are likely to associate those neutrinos with the sun of course it's possible that there is something behind the sun that is making those neutrinos and then you are seeing those or something along the way but you know you can correct for those carefully so direction is one possibility the other is energy if you can measure the energy of the neutrino and you know the mechanism with which these different sources are making their neutrinos such that you know the energy that those neutrinos have then you know the energy of the neutrino that you have measured tells you something about which of the sources was possible okay so these are the kind of tricks timing is another method so suppose you have an accelerator which you know is making neutrinos at some particular time and you only see neutrinos at that time then you can be sure that you are observing neutrinos from the accelerator so these are the different ways time energy direction uh, okay just a couple of more questions uh, is there any time difference between the detection of gamma and neutrino yes yes there is some time difference i don't exactly remember i can look up my slides if you want but uh, it is not necessarily just because neutrinos took some time extra let's say to come to earth or any such thing these are also emitted at different times so it's not that the neutrino and the photons are emitted at exactly the same time and you know there's some time difference from which you learn something you can make such approximations and assumptions but uh, yeah they are not emitted together okay um the last question i'll take is you mentioned that the distant objects can be discovered through uh, neutrinos so was mars discovered through neutrinos no mars was not discovered through neutrinos you could see mars with your naked eyes uh, uh, you know we have given a telescope uh, you know on a good evening you can look up and you can see mars um but uh, can we discover objects using neutrinos the answer is yes so for example if there is a supernova that happens in our galaxy but behind the center of the galaxy it is very likely that we will not be able to see it with optical telescopes because the dust obscures the supernova but the neutrinos will penetrate the dust and we will see them and this can be a way in which you discover supernova in the galaxy using neutrinos okay uh, there are a lot of appreciation uh, expressed by many viewers on youtube i want to know if there's any any more question from the zoom somebody has a question please uh, unmute yourself and ask so if not i will uh, thank the speaker dr basudev das gupta once again for uh, really exciting talk i'm sure everybody is going to go back and wait for supernova now uh, in the coming days and before we end i want to uh, so thank you basu for a really really a nice talk as i said that uh, bringing up the excitement and before we end i will like to just introduce the uh, next week's uh, event next week's ipa 50 event is slightly different 
than our uh, conventional event. The main change being it will start at 4 p.m. We have a special event addressing the gender issue. So we have a lecture by Professor Ram Ramaswamy on the life of Dr. Anandi Bhai Zoshi. Dr. Anandi Bhai Zoshi was the first uh, woman doctor from India. This will be followed by the panel discussion, Women in Physics, where do we go from here? Panelists are Radha Balakrishnan, Nishita Desai, Prajwal Shastri, Pratibha Jolly, Sunil Mukhi, and Bulumoni Kalita. Please note the change in time. Next Saturday, we will start at 4 p.m. So I hope to see you all next week at 4 p.m. And uh, yeah, send us uh, your comments, suggestions by email and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Uh -huh.